first item of business today is general questions. The first question is from Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government when the Minister for Transport and the Islands last met ScotRail and what issues were discussed. Minister Hamza Youssef. This morning, our discussion centred on ScotRail's recent performance. I also received an update on the morning peak initiatives being progressed with a performance improvement plan. Anas Sarwar. I thank the Minister for that reply. Regulated rare fares are due to rise in the new year, with passengers expected to pay more for services which the Transport Minister himself does not believe are off an acceptable standard. When he next meets with ScotRail, will he enter into discussions regarding Labour's proposal to stop the new year fare hike going ahead and to freeze fares for passengers in 2017? Minister. I would reflect uh, what the First Minister said in answer to uh, Kezia's proposal, Kezia Dugdale's proposal last week, we can give every uh, proposal consideration. Uh, what I would say is that when it comes to fare increases, they are at their lowest since we got the powers in 2005. But he's correct to say that the performance is not at a standard that I find acceptable. So any proposal that he puts forward, that his party or other parties put forward, uh, will be given appropriate consideration. Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you. The improvement plan published earlier this week contains some 250 measures. Very welcome, but some of these won't be delivered for two years. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will appreciate passengers don't want to wait that length of time to see real improvements in the service. What deadlines has he given ScotRail for improvements, and what are the sanctions that will apply if these deadlines are not met? Minister. I want to uh, thank the member for, for the question. What I would say is 249 points, around about six of them, have a long-term uh, long deadline. That doesn't mean the work won't start on them immediately. The work will start on them immediately. All it means is that there's a continual process of uh, monitoring, of continuing work uh, on, for example, cable uh, signal renewal or uh, indeed uh, uh, tra uh, points uh, renewal uh, as well. So I would give assurances that the vast majority of the 249 measures in the performance plan are being worked on right now. Uh, in terms of sanctions and, and improvements, what I would say is I'm looking for immediate improvement. That's why in the last eight-week period, uh, performance has improved from uh, 89.5 to 89.8. I want to see it continue to improve further. Uh, and in relation to his very last point, if that performance dips, uh, which I don't think it will, I'm confident that uh, it won't get to that break point, that 84.3. But of course, uh, as the First Minister has said, every option uh, is, is on the table uh, and remains on the table within uh, the specifications of the contract. John Mason. Hey, thank you. The UK government introduced rail franchising in the 1990s, as I understand it, and the legislation precluded any UK public sector organisation bidding uh, to operate a railway service. Can the Minister outline what work is underway to ensure that a public sector operator could bid for a future rail contract? Minister. I think it's a fair point that the member makes that, uh, of course, previous UK governments did nothing to allow a public sector operator to bid. It was this government that brought forward the changes in legislation which removed the prohibition for a public sector operator uh, to bid. On his, on his precise point, I had a very constructive meeting uh, with other political parties. All of them in the chamber here were represented. They came to that meeting, I thought, with a constructive tone uh, and indeed with some constructive suggestions. Rail unions were also represented in that meeting, as were RTPs uh, and indeed the voice of the passenger as well. It was constructive. We agreed to enter into a formal engagement process early next year and for Transport Scotland officials to come up with some options, uh, looking at the governance structures, looking at the broad principles uh, and a few other points uh, as well. So the discussions were constructive. Uh, it was in our manifesto. It's a commitment that we will deliver and I'm pleased that we paved the legislative way for a public sector operator to put forward a public sector. But Question to James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government uh, whether it will provide an update on what step to, steps it is taking to improve the performance of ScotRail. Minister. Uh, as Mr Kelly will no doubt uh, be aware from last week's uh, statement to Parliament, I have instructed a performance improvement plan. <laughs> Details of the 249 actions underway have now been published in the ScotRail, uh, ScotRail's website. I continue to closely monitor the effectiveness of the plan to improve PPM on a trend towards our challenging, ambitious, uh, but achievable contract targets. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Today's discussions around a public potential public sector bid are driven by concerns about performance. Can I therefore ask what steps, one of the, sorry, one of the barriers to an early public sector uh, option in relation to ScotRail is the existing contractual position with Abellio. Can I therefore ask 
what steps the Minister has taken to assess how an early termination of their Bellio contract could be achieved if performance uh, does not improve, uh, how, how that can be achieved at minimum cost to the public purse. Minister. The points that Mr Kelly makes. First of all, the reason why a public sector operator is being allowed to bid uh, in the future, uh, when a future franchise opportunity comes up is not driven by uh, current situation. It's driven by the fact that we had it in our manifesto, we stood in that manifesto and we won the election. So that's the first reason around uh, why these discussions are, are taking place. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing to, to try to be helpful to the member is I don't think we should start this discussion, and passengers certainly wouldn't thank us for this, start the discussion by saying uh, how can we make our, uh, you know, our, our, our railways, are they failing? Uh, let's, uh, let's rip up the contract uh, from Abellio right here, right now. Instead, what we should, what we should, we should be saying is how do we work with Abellio to improve the performance right here for passengers right now? That's where we have the 249-point improvement plan. And in the meantime, let's do the constructive work we're doing, which uh, you know, the member beside him, Neil Bibby, uh, was at that meeting, I, I think, gave some constructive suggestions uh, on some of the, the labour uh, ambitions for a public sector operator. Let's work towards that and let's realise that it will take time to put forward a public sector operator and a public sector bid. You have to have the right vehicle to do that. You have to potentially have ensure that the right statutory and the right uh, guidelines are in place. You have to ensure the right expertise uh, are also uh, on board as well. But we're doing that work now because there is a potential for a break clause, as he knows, in 2020. Uh, so that work will continue in earnest. But let's all coalesce and get together to ensure that right here and right now, we put forward the, the, the best performance and indeed uh, the best experience for passengers and commuters across Scotland. Bob Doris. Minister, the Scotland Road franchise contains the toughest quality regime within the UK to drive up standards for passengers. However, where standards fail to meet the prescribed level of service, what specific penalties can be levied against the franchise holder? Minister. Member may be aware we have uh, the toughest auditing regime on these islands, the Squire regime, uh, as it's known, and members will know it by. Uh, that is a tough uh, regime that looks at a range of measures from the cleanliness of toilets uh, at, at stations right the way through, of course, uh, to, to measures on, on, on the train and the rolling stock itself. And if uh, ScotRail and Bellio do not live up to those very high auditing standards, uh, then a financial uh, contribution is made. That uh, uh, last contribution was 500 uh, in, the, in the order of £500,000. And the important point is we've ensured that that gets invested back into the railways. Uh, I know uh, previous uh, members from across the chambers have asked uh, where those improvements uh, uh, have given suggestions of where those improvements can be made, and I'll be uh, open-minded to suggestions that come forward. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recently, I received a number of complaints from constituents about overcrowding on the Wa Waverley Line. On Saturday, the 19th of November, a football and a rugby match coincided in Edinburgh, creating uh, no over normal demand. Um, and I wondered if the minister would ask. If the Minister would tell us what action the Scottish Government are taking in the short term to ensure sufficient capacity is provided to meet demand for transport to events. Minister. I, I thank the Member uh, for the question. What I would say is when a major event does take place, ScotRail has a, a special team that will come together uh, to ensure the management of that. Uh, that includes, of course, the, uh, the, the, the capacity on trains, but also moving passengers in a safe manner uh, from the station to where the next venue is. In terms of the overcrowding issue, uh, it's one that... Uh, uh, actually tells of a story uh, of growth in passenger numbers. So since 2007, our railways have become 33% more popular. Uh, what we've done uh, on top of that is to increase the number of carriages and the amount of rolling stock that we have on our network. So from 2007 uh, through to our ambitious plans in 2019, there'll be 50% more uh, capacity uh, on the network. Uh, we added from 2007 140 carriages. From now until 2019, we'll add an additional 200 carriages. So she can be rest assured we're doing what we can to uh, increase capacity where there is opportunities and where there are opportunities to increase uh, that capacity, to add more rolling stock. Uh, we'll always look for those opportunities. But I'd be more than happy uh, for her if she wishes to meet ScotRail's team that look at uh, major events and how the planning and coordination of those take place and to give her a briefing on that if she would find it helpful. Question three, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its priorities are for public transport. Minister. Uh, we are investing over £1 billion uh, in public uh, transport annually and other sustainable transport options to encourage people out of their cars. A £5 billion investment in Scotland's railways is committed over the five-year period to 2019. <laughs> uh, that includes 17 new high-spec electric trains for delivery from 2017 and 75 new sleeper vehicles from 2018. 
Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Of the action points set out in the infrastructure section of the Performance Improvement Plan, could the Minister tell us how many are actually new announcements and how many relate to undertakings which had already been given by the Scottish Government, their partners in the rail industry to improve public transport? And could the Minister also confirm that the action points uh, scheduled to be delivered by the end of November have been delivered? Minister. What I would say is that uh, eight million pounds of infrastructure investment has been accelerated. So that's eight million pounds worth of improvements that were going to take place later have now been brought forward. And that's part of uh, the improvement plans. Uh, the last discussion I had with ScotRail, uh, they were telling me that work had been well underway. So some of the improvement plan, uh, 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 some of the improvement plan actions have already been uh, uh, committed to and have, have, have been done. Uh, others, of course, are still to be done. I, of course, will be monitoring that. Uh, that uh, document on the ScotRail website is a live working document. Uh, so where, for example, there has an action point, there are actually a number of sub-actions below that that have to be done. So I'll be monitoring that closely. I think uh, uh, all of us uh, no doubt will be. I want to see an improvement in performance here and now, and we're on the uh, right trajectory uh, to achieve that. Richard Lockhead. In, in terms of promoting cycling, the Minister may be aware there's a community-led campaign in Forest to extend a cycle route alongside A96 to Brodie but there appears to be a deadlock, a long-standing deadlock between Transport Scotland and the community campaigners. And I wonder if the Transport Minister would be willing to speak to Transport Scotland to find a way to unlock that deadlock so we can improve cycling links on the A96 along to Brodie. Minister. Uh, I'm aware of that deadlock or the um, impasse as, as, as he describes it. I, I note that he's written to me uh, on this very subject. I'll look to personally uh, intervene uh, in the matter and speak to Sc uh, Transport Scotland and, and, and inform him. Uh, of uh, any update. What I would say is our commitment to active travel uh, is one that I think speaks for itself. Uh, a record investment uh, beyond what any other government has put towards cycling and, and, and walking uh, will continue to do that. It's important for the environmental impact, important to get Scotland uh, healthier uh, as well. Uh, so I will give that commitment uh, to have a look at that specific issue that I know about and that he's written to me about in the A96 between Forrest and Brodie and I'll come back to him in, in, in good time. Question for John Lamond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it, when it will publish details of the proposed single national board to oversee economic development and skills funding. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review will include work to take forward the detailed consideration and planning of the new single strategic Scotland-wide statutory board that's intended to coordinate the activities of Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. That work will also look at taking forward our commitment to establish a new vehicle to meet the unique enterprise and skills needs of the south of Scotland. It began on the 1st of November 2016. It is intended to take around six months until spring 2016, uh, 2017. John Lamond. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. I was heartened when the Scottish Government announced it was implementing the Scottish Conservative idea of a South of Scotland enterprise agency. However, given the news that the HIE regional board is to go, I can only presume that South of Scotland enterprise will also be overseen by a national board. There was a real opportunity to create a local organisation to support economic development in the borders and elsewhere in the south of Scotland, but I fear that that opportunity is being missed by the Scottish Government's cent centralising agenda. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is the point in setting up a dedicated agency for the south of Scotland and then running the agency from the central belt? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure whether the implication of that is that the Tories have withdrawn their support for the idea of a separate South of Scotland agency. And of course, it may well have been a Tory idea, but like many Tory ideas, it was one that was never uh, brought into force, something they never got round to doing. And it's taken an SNP government uh, to take that forward. <laughs> And I think that's to the credit of the SNP government that once again we took forward action to help in the south of Scotland, whereas the Tories, in all the long years that they've had the possibility of doing that, did not do that. I think in relation to the strategic board, the issue of its governance and how it relates to the separate agencies, all of which will be guaranteed, the legal status guaranteed and which will remain. I think it's important to understand that the second part, phase two of that review, will also be looking at one of its work streams as to the governance arrangements, as to how it relates to the individual uh, agencies which will remain. So that work is ongoing. It will involve the people most closely involved uh, in those agencies and will also have representation from uh, the interests, if you, if you like, of the south of Scotland. So I'm confident that the people involved in that, some very high-caliber people, will be able to take that forward. 
and ensure that we get the right governance arrangements to take forward this new idea, this new development brought forward by the SNP to establish a South of Scotland agency. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide assurance to my constituents and to me about the future of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which is absolutely critical to the Highlands? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to repeat the assurances I and other colleagues have made about retaining HIE, including its Inverness headquarters, including control over staffing, including its own NDPB status uh, and its chief executive and the services, crucially, the same people in high that are providing the services to businesses and individuals now will be doing that at the end of this review. Uh, the review made a specific recommendation to maintain high in this way uh, to offer just the assurance requested. And as to the allegations of decentralisation, well, there's a real problem with that, isn't there? If we're establishing an agency in the south of Scotland, it doesn't sound much like decentralisation to me. This is making sure that we have the right services for the right parts of Scotland and the assurance says that HIE will remain as an agency and that will be enshrined in law. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the widespread opposition about this wrong-headed centralisation, will the Scottish Government listen to the people of the Highlands and Islands and change their minds about scrapping the High Board and keep management and decision-making in the area? Cabinet Secretary. As I've just said, the management uh, and the decision making and the services provided by those in HIE to services, to people, to individuals and companies in that area will remain. And it's also true to say that as we go forward to discuss and agree on the governance arrangements between the new overarching board and that uh, agency, then people involved in high currently at board level will be involved in those discussions I would hope would lead those discussions and they will have a view of course in making sure that the particular interests of high are replicated in the governance structure which is then agreed that may take many different forms the crucial point is that people involved in high now will be involved in that process and also that high which it can't currently do to the extent that we want to see happen will also be able to access much more easily the services of SDI of SE of the fund Council, so we do get that alignment across all the different ages in, in Scotland to not just build upon what I have achieved over the last 50 years, but to improve it even further to the benefit of people in that area. Question number five, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on when construction will actually start on the A90 grade separated junction at Lawrence Kirk. Minister Hamza Youssef. As I have previously advised the member on the 11th of August under written parliamentary question, uh, uh, work has already started on the A90 grade separated uh, junction in terms of uh, consultants being appointed, but delivery of the scheme itself can only commence when the scheme is approved, of course, under the statutory procedures and thereafter a timetable for construction can be determined. Mike Rumbles. In a letter to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, He's just said that despite a, a, a decade of waiting, he's take, to take the next th three years on an assessment process, another year to draft the road orders, and a further three years after that, if there are no objections, before he plans to start work on construction, but in any case, not before 2021. What are local people to make of this? Kicking it into the period after this government will be long gone. If the minister is serious about saving lives at this junction, and this is not a laughing matter, I take the minister for parliament, if he's serious about saving lives at this junction, why will he not instruct Transport Scotland to get a move on? Minister. They remind the member that when his party were in government, of course, they did frankly hee-haw for those on the A90. What they, what, they, what they did was put forward temporary measures while, of course, we're putting forward a permanent solution which is the grade separation, backed by £24 million worth of investment. Uh, so what I would say to the member is the statutory process is important because it involves the public in terms of the best option, the preferred option, the consultation. If he doesn't want the public to be involved, well, I would say to him that's highly illiberal and highly undemocratic. Yeah. <laughs> Ross Thompson. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, given the Scottish Government also promised a 200 million investment in rail improvements between Aberdeen and the Central Belt at the same time as the Lawrence Kirk announcement, can the Minister provide a start date for this crucial project to improve journey times for train passengers? 
Minister. No, discussions are already taking place. I'm more than happy to inform him and write to him about some, how some of those discussions uh, are progressing. I met with the RTP uh, uh, to, yesterday just to have that discussion. Uh, work is underway. Uh, of course, uh, he'll understand that as part of the initial, uh, additional investment we're giving is to make sure that we do a, a transport, a £5 million transport appraisal uh, of the region uh, as well. So I'm looking forward to working with the councils, working with the RTPs, working with local members. In terms of a specific update, I'll write to him uh, to give him that in terms of how the discussions uh, are progressing. Thank you.